Well, thank you so much to the organizers for this fantastic symposium they've been putting together for almost two months now, and also for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, and it was also great to present on the same session as Zev, because our work really builds off of his, and we're uh, really partnering to advance testing from the point of care to, to the home. And our project has been a collaborative effort of a very large team, and I, I'm merely the spokesman here. So as the number of COVID cases continues to decline, there is pressure to return back to work and school in a way that maximizes both safety and productivity. And as we all know, we need to be careful because wrong policies can lead to outbreaks of cases and large second waves. Now, there are several strategies to ease the restrictive lockdowns in place around the world. And so here's a very partial list um, that is by no means exhaustive, but really illustrates the different approaches. So one of the strategies is to wait uh, for a vaccine to, to become available or to help develop it. So we can reach a herd immunity, but we don't know when this will, it could take years. Another approach that has been floated um, in some parts is issuing immunity passports for people who have antibodies against the, against the virus. And, and this is assumes, which is uh, a reasonable assumption, but not yet proven that these antibodies, at least some of them will provide uh, immunity. And again, we, we don't know how long these uh, antibodies will last. And one of the problems is that even in the, some of the most affected areas in the world, still a very low fraction of people have antibodies, which in uh, around 20% in New York City. And we need to get up to 60 to 70% of positive people to reach uh, levels of herd immunity that are safe, and safe enough for, to release these uh, severe lockdowns. Another approach is to, as was one of the questions earlier for Dr. Shang, is how effective, uh, by Dr. Califano, is how effective is just wearing face masks and hygiene and, and keep your social distance as much as possible. Well, this is a very cheap and uh, easy, low-tech solution, but it might not be the most effective strategy. And, and as Dr. Shang answered, this may be putting many vulnerable people at, at risk and also does not really prevent transmission within families. And another strategy, uh, which is one of the one most floated around, is that testing for acute infection and uh, coupled with contact tracing. And this really allows more people to leave home in a shorter time frame. Uh, but the, really the risk of this strategy really depend on the details of the implementation. And this, depending on the approach, can, can also be expensive. So here's one of the implementation of testing and, and contact tracing. And this one involves, um, involves people uh, using their phones as a, as a means to detect contacts between infected people represented here by this Bluetooth sign. So in this case, we have a, a, a subject A that has an infection but has not yet developed symptoms. So on day one, he goes around his life, goes commutes to work and then returns back home. But on the next day, he, he wakes up with fever or other symptoms. He requests a home test that is sent, sent to him and then he gets a positive result. So then because we know who this person was in contact with the day before when he had no symptoms, then there's a signal sent to all of these contacts to alert them and to, to ask them to isolate or uh, for for two, for two weeks. And then other people who had less contact are um, advice on social distancing. However, there are several issues with this approach. One is that the relationship between Bluetooth things and the risk of transmission is still unclear. Uh, it depends on the time of proximity and if there were barriers or no barriers, if people were wearing masks, for example, and also requires most people in the community, in a community to participate in this Bluetooth proximity tracking to be able to trace and isolate uh, these contacts. Um, and this also has the potential to miss tracking and isolating contacts of people with asymptomatic transmission. Um, this example here illustrates how much time one has to detect an infection and alert contact after this happens. So in this case, we have this person, Alice, who becomes infected at day zero, and we know uh, people become uh, contagious around three to four days after they uh, become infected themselves. So on day, she be, on day four, she, she contacts Bob and transmits the virus to Bob, and she only develops symptoms on day five. So then she gets tested, and she gets tested on day seven, and the results come back quickly. So then from day, five, from day four to day seven, then you can alert Bob that 
Alice tested positive, so then Bob is isolated before he becomes contagious. Now he's wearing a face mask. So then you can break the transmission chain here, prevent it from going to Carol. So this illustrates how there is roughly a 48 hour window after an index case develops symptoms to, to test and alert contacts. And this is really a tight schedule and does not really prevent transmission from undocumented cases, which may account for a large fraction of transmissions according to analysis by the group of Jeff Shaman here at Mailman School. So what if instead of testing people only when they are symptomatic, we, we instead test them at regular basis? And what if we don't ask them to go somewhere to be tested and wait for several hours, or as um, Zev mentioned, even for uh, half an hour to half an hour to get the results, but rather have everyone test themselves at home every morning. If you're positive, you stay home and you don't put others at risk, not even on your way to get tested. So to measure the effects of what a home test would have on transmission, Jeff Shaman ran some simulations of how many transmissions would occur at work at a place, for example, like the Zuckerman Institute here at Columbia, where roughly around a thousand people come to work. So he estimated the effects of te different testing frequencies, again, at home, if people are uh, test themselves every day, every weekday, what if they only get tested twice a week, and what if they're tested uh, only once a week. And, and the results are, are pretty interesting. So these are the, he ran several simulations of how many infections would occur at work for in, in, in a month, in 28 days. And this on each row are different levels of community R zeros. So from 0.6 to 1.6. And, and here in the color illustrates the mean number of transmissions that happen at work. And so this is, these are the results that happen if you're tested every day. You see that in the simulations, you get almost zero. Uh, the average is very close to zero cases of transmission at work. And this is the fraction of all the 100 simulations that have more than one uh, transmission at work, which is uh, in, the, in the most um, severe uh, conditions, it's around 0.5. What, what becomes very clear is that the less frequent you do this test, here is with no testing at all, you see many more numbers of transmissions happening at work. So there is a clear dependency of the frequency of the testing, and there's also a clear dependency on the on the level of infections that are happening in the community. If nobody else in New York outside of work is, uh, is becoming infected, then you have zero transmissions at work, of course. And, but if there's many, like 40,000 here community infections, you have a very high effect on the transmissions that happen at work as well. The, and, and this is much less dependent on the, on the community R, R value. And, and in this case, I'm showing you the results for simulations uh, with an R0 of 0.9 at work, but the results actually, this effects of uh, transmission of multi testing at different intervals are consistent from R0 that go from 0.53 all the way from to 1.41. So, so we're convinced that some of these home tests would be beneficial, not just for a place like Zuckerman, but for people to go to school and to, and to go to, uh, to work everywhere. So what are the ideal requirements of a home test? We want them to be fast, that it's non-invasive and safe to perform that it's uh, low technology and, and simple, that it, you don't need to be a scientist to, to do the test, that it's inexpensive, and that will also yield accurate enough results. Now, the standard of care uh, quantitative PCR tests require expensive equipment, uh, and like these thermocyclers, and they also take several hours. So this is really not an option for home testing. Instead, one of the most promising avenues for a home test are those uh, based on isothermal amplification of viral RNA, such as the LAMP method that Zeb uh, beautifully illustrated. Uh, so, because he, he just explained this a couple minutes ago, I, I saved all of this explanation of how the assay works, but I'll just I'll give a summary for people who may have missed uh, his presentation. So, one of these tests that has been uh, approved uh, is this LAMP Sherlock based technique. Uh, which works again either by a swab or through saliva and this is transferred to a to a, a a tube with the reagents which are just maintained at a constant temperature of 60 degrees and then this is coupled with a detection not by color but instead through the um, this, this is a one meter warning one 
I think I've only had nine minutes presenting according to my timer. Oh, uh, uh, that's interesting. Okay, well, we can get we okay. can go a little bit further. All right. So, uh, so this one still requires some equipment, and it it also requires um, this CRISPR. It requires CRISPR proteins, and it requires this uh, lateral flow assays. So we think the way to go is the same um, way that uh, Zev illustrated, and other people around uh, the U.S. and around the world have worked on this colorimetric assay. There's work by uh, Chris Mason at Cornell and Connie Sepko at Harvard, and and people at NEB. And the way it works here, you can see how if you have many copies of viral RNA, you can the reaction becomes yellow, and if the and, and in your controls with no viral, no template control, the reaction is magenta. And, and Chris Mason has shown that this has a very high sensitivity and specificity uh, in swabs, he, uh, not yet in saliva. As I mentioned, getting this to work in saliva is much more challenging. Uh, but it, compared to the RT-PCR, this has a pretty high sensitivity and specificity. So our, our goal has been to develop, take this a step further from the point of care uh, testing or from the th throat swabs in which this uh, lamp reaction is already shown to work pretty well to get it to work at home and with saliva, which is a much less invasive method. So the workflow is like this, people spit into a tube, then you transfer some volume of that saliva, mix it with some reagents, you incubate it in a sous vide or in another way of controlling the temperature constant at 60 to 65 degrees, and then 30 to 45 minutes later, you take your reactions and you see if they're yellow or pink, and you have positive and negative controls to make sure the reactions happen well at home. Um, so we've made uh, quite a uh, quite a bit of progress on, on this front, uh, on, on again, optimizing this assay to work in saliva and to make it as sensitive as possible. So if we compare many of the published and uh, primers or those that are in preprints and some that have been communicated to us uh, ahead of time. So we've compared many of these primers both singly and in combinations. We've tested multiple temperatures. We've tested multiple detergents to make this reaction work uh, in saliva. And we've tested multiple additives that other groups have shown uh, uh, make the reaction more efficient. And, and based, on, uh, based on this work, we can now detect 10 to 100 viral copies of RNA. And, and we're pushing the limit every day. We get uh, different combinations or different uh, additives that make their reaction work more efficiently. So now we can also reliably detect synthetic viral RNA spiked into saliva, although not at the at the low level that we at the sensitivity we'd like. And something important to note is that infected patients uh, they range from 10, 10 to 20 million copies of viral RNA per microliter with an average of 500,000 copies. So I, we think this is well within the range because we don't use just a single microliter, but we can use multiple microliters of saliva in our reaction. We also have positive controls working in saliva, so we can detect ACE2 uh, uh, human endogenous transcript, mRNA, not 100%, but we're working to get it to work 100% of the time. And we do have these other two controls uh, working very reliably. Uh, so our next steps is to continue optimizing this test for, for saliva. And we're also working on the most efficient and simple methods for temperature control uh, at home. And then once we have uh, these uh, optimized methods, we're going to validate them with uh, clinical samples with LDAT HOD and then, uh, and then further more, more widely. And then we're coupling this assay with an app so we can document the test. People can take a picture and can become documented. And in case some of the, the results, the color change is not as clear, the, the app will, will send the result back to the user. What is the chance that you have a positive or negative reaction? And next, we would like to deploy this test first as a, as a trial or research trial, and then I, ideally make it widely available. Um, so. Yeah, in summary, we think that at, at home test that it's inexpensive, easy to use and fast would allow society to go to work and school in a safe and efficient way. And, and it's been a great uh, enterprise working with so many talented people, uh, both at ZMBBI and people from uh, biological sciences and people uh, uptown and throughout the world who have shared reagents and advice and expertise and uh, 
uh, and worked around the clock to, to get this to work. The, this molecular test has been um, led by, by David Inc, who's done a fantastic work coordinating and doing many of these optimizations, but the work of many other people, and I, I hope I'm not missing anyone because it's been a large team. And thank you, everyone. Great, uh, thank you very much. Uh, sorry for the mistiming, but uh, sorry, we're, running, sorry. we're running a little bit of, over time, so maybe a couple of quick questions if there are. Sure. Okay. Margaret and Itzik. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, it would certainly be great if there was some sort of a test that's as easy as taking a pregnancy test, test or so. Um, but I worry about this, and I'm wondering if you have given any thought to this, is that you know, you'd know you have to trust that individuals are gonna actually take the test every day. Um, and that if the test tests positive, that they would actually stay at home. So what sort of a check and balance control would you uh, think about installing so that you know you can be sure that people are actually taking the test? Yeah, this is a very good question. And this is not something we're uh, trying to implement as the development of the test, but I think this would be more up to the policy people, the government, the companies, the institutions. Do you need to present a negative result before you go to work or you go to school? That we're really focusing on the science here and the engineering rather than on the policy of how this would be administered. But we think that even uh, if not everybody does the test and some people skip one day, the transmission would still uh, decrease uh, dramatically. So it doesn't need to be perfect to work, even if the sensitivity is not 100%. And if not everybody does it, it would still have a, a large impact. This is still to be determined with further analysis and simulations, but at least uh, this is what we're thinking. It's a Thanks, and that's for the talk. Uh, speaking of uh, back to school, we are in a school. Uh, has, has there been any interaction with the uh, with the um, uh, university regarding uh, trying this or trying uh, deployment uh, at Columbia? Right, but as you know, the, we're doing our best to get this to work as quickly as possible, but. We cannot guarantee when this is going to happen. So I guess it would be a little risky to rely on this test becoming available and cheap enough and simple enough that all students could take it every morning. This is really our goal. We know this could have a large impact, but we cannot promise anyone by September we will have this test validated, approved, and ready. So, um, but, but we know this could be as very useful for in many cases. 